Yeah, so um, I'm going to ask some questions. Uh, so we're going to keep going with seepage. Get through the learning objectives because you've probably seen that three or four times now. Um, so now we're going to go through a few different flow nets and see if I can get some question answers about uh, some errors that people might see in this. Um, are there any takers on, I'm going to have Greg in the back, I think, pass around the microphone, but here's an example of a flow net um, underneath a seepage weir. Or like, so maybe at a, um, uh, on a spillway, something like that. Uh, can anybody see any issues with this flow net that they want to point out? Yeah, the flow line and the uh, horizontal isn't perpendicular to those. The flow line isn't the isn't perpendicular to the to the line. Is that what you said? The ground surface couldn't. Oh! Oh! Yeah! 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 Yep! 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 Exactly. Yep. That's an issue. Thank you, Olivia. <laughs> Any others? Okay. Oh, I see someone in the back. Okay. Um, are the flow lines supposed to extend up to the water surface? The flow lines don't extend up to the water surface? Uh, no, they are not supposed to extend up to the water surface. So the flow lines only go through uh, soil. So that's okay. I think we had one more in the back here. Um, I can't, can you put it up closer? The mic keeps cutting out. Now? Yes. Uh, the squares are not completely square. There's some that are longer and Yep, yep, that's another good one. Yep, so the biggest error on this one, um, as pointed out, is uh, the ground surface lines upstream here and downstream here. Um, are considered the equipotential lines because the head along the length of each of those is the same. In this case, it's equal to the water surface because there's a water head on all this. And on this side, it's equal to zero because it's at atmospheric pressure. Um, so you can't have any equipotential lines tying into other equipotential lines. So I think someone pointed that out. Um, that was the biggest one. Um, there was some, I think there was some, some a comment that squares, these weren't square. Um, and that was because they're not tying into the right lines. So, yep, you caught that. Um, so that, that's the biggest error on this one. All right. Next one. There's one really big error here that I wanted to highlight. Oh, I think that one's old. Uh, the flow line, the way they intersect, like, the uh, it's not perpendicular for right. <laughs> the flow line is not correct. Is that what you said? Yeah, we're in intersect with the impervious layer at the bottom. Mm -hmm, exactly. Exactly. Yep. Um, there's the at the bottom here. Um, is the bottom of that that flow model, um, and it's a uh, no flow boundary at this point. Um, and they're tying into this boundary, and you can't have flow going into a no flow boundary because they, they go away and they come back, and there's no flow channels, and so there's nowhere for the flow to go. Okay. How about this one? Assuming this is an isotropic soil media, we'll have, we'll have to make that assumption. The flow lines and the potential lines. 
they're not meeting at right angles. Yep. Okay. Thanks, Lydia. Yep. That's exactly it. They're not meeting properly, so you're not going to get accurate results in your model. All right. So this last one's a bit of a trick question. Um, I'm not going to ask y'all to point anything out here. Uh, this one, there may be some small errors still left in this one. This is, uh, but this is a much better representation of the flow net for this cross section. Um, and they pointed out here equipotential lines, the water surface. There's a sheet pile wall here. There's a weir here. Um, so while there's probably still a few, maybe minor issues with this, this is a, probably a pretty reasonable initial sketch. All right. So now that I've given you a very, 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 very brief introduction to FlowNet <clears throat> and probably uh, put you to sleep with all of the different ways you can draw FlowNet, um, now I'm going to talk a little bit about what we can use FlowNet for. Um, so we've, you've drawn a FlowNet, you've calculated, it, and now you need to calculate some stuff from it. What can you calculate? You can calculate seepage quantities. You can calculate pore water pressures at anywhere in your model. You can calculate gradients at anywhere in your model. You can calculate uplift pressures. Say you have a concrete structure there that you're concerned about um, having some issues with uplift. You can calculate pressures on the bottom of that model. Um, a big thing is design of seepage reduction or collection measures. So uh, if you have a chimney drain, you want to make sure that chimney drain is big enough. Um, and 99.9% .9 of the time it will be. Um, and it also will help you design any uh, filter or drain system. So if you're going to be putting a tow drain pipe in, you want to make sure your tow drain pipe's big enough, stuff like that. And I suspect GBA will be talking, or Greg will be talking a little bit more about all that later on in his design discussion, the, the design part of that stuff. But I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the, the different calculations you can do to, in evaluating flow nets. So the first thing you can take a look at is seepage quantities. So um, the equation you use for seepage quantity, calculating seepage quantities, is Q, the, uh, which gives you your discharge per unit width of your cross-section. So you're looking at a 2D model. So to extend that to the full length of your dam, you need to multiply that by the length of your dam in the end. But at the beginning, you start out with a, a discharge in that 2D section. Um, you multiply it, that, that is equal to your hydraulic conductivity, K, times the total head drop through your flow net, the number of flow paths you have divided by the number of equipotential drops. And I've seen this written as N sub P or N sub D, um, either one. So, um, so that N sub F over N sub P or N sub D is a what they call a shape factor for a flow net calculation. So as an example, um, this figure, I'm still trying to figure out exactly where it came from, but um, it's in uh, Reclamation's current seepage design standard. Uh, they actually credit the Army Corps for developing it. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised, but I could not find it in the current Army Corps documentation. So um, there's some question as to whose dam this is, but um, my guess is it's probably one of ours, one of the Army Corps dams. So just as some calculations, I'll point out some stuff here on this model. Um, there's a rock fill toe here and then a homogeneous cross-section. Uh, it's called an impervious embankment, which makes me think it's Army Corps because we like calling things impervious when they're low permeability. Um, there's a, it's isotropic in this case, so KH is equal to KV, and then there's the calculation, uh, there's the feet per minute. Um, so they give me this in feet per minute. Uh, so keep track of those units. And then there are three flow channels here. But the fun part, um, which is not uncommon, is that this last flow channel is not a full flow channel, it's a partial flow channel. And that's pointed out here, showing a not full square. So the number of flow channels is 2.65 flow channels. Um, and the way to measure this would be you, you actually do the measurement on a true section. Um, and then the number of equipotential drops, there you can see them here, up through nine. So there's nine equipotential drops. So they've taken the total head and they've split it up into equal fractions of total head, and the total head is 40 feet of head. So um, they've also done some calculations here. Delta H is 40 feet over nine equipotential drops, so there's 4.45 feet of head between each equipotential drop. That'll be helpful um, as we go later on in our calculations. Um, this, let's see, anything else I want to point out? Um, the 
uh, impervious boundary down here. So they've assumed that the foundation is impervious for this calculation, so it doesn't factor into the calculation. So to calculate the discharge per unit width of the section, you do Q equals K times H times your shape factor. So you have K, 0 0.005, zeros there, times 40 feet of head, times 2.65, which is the number of flow channels, over 9, which is the number of echo potential drops, and that gives you your um, calculation or your Q in feet cubed per minute per unit width of your embankment. Don't forget that. And then you can then you can calculate and, and compare this to useful things like gallons per minute and stuff like that. And that can go into a calculation maybe for a tow drain. Okay. So something else you can calculate is the pore pressure, and you can do that at pretty much any location you want. Um, whatever is of interest to you in your analysis. So here's the equation for pore pressure. So uh, U at that location is equal to the number of echo potential drops between your location and zero potential. So going from the bottom of your model up um, over your number of total echo potential drops times the total head drop in the flow net. So that gives you a partial head drop here at that location minus your vertical distance um, between your location and zero potential elevation, so that removes your your pressure head, your elevation head, gets that down to, and gets that out of the way, so you're just dealing with um, just those uh, actual pore pressures, and you multiply that by the unit weight of water to convert it to a pressure from a head. So, I've done that at three different locations. So you can see point E, point F, and point G. Um, so I'll just go through point E, and then um, if you have questions, we can go through the others too, because um, I find poor pressures to be the most confusing part of calculations. Um, so first you count the number of echo potential drops from zero potential up, so from the toe up to point E, so that gets up to one, two, three, four, five, and six. So E is a long line six. So you're at six, and then you divide that by nine, and you multiply that times the total head, so that's 40 feet ahead, and that gets you your, your partial head at that location. And then this is the fun part. You subtract out your elevation head. you got to go from point E, and you kind of trace over, and you're looking at somewhere between 15 and 20 feet. Um, this measured accurately was 17.8 feet. You subtract that out. That gives you your head at that location. Um, and then you multiply that times your unit weight of water and that gets you a pore pressure. Um, and if you all have questions, raise your hand, and, uh, ha and one of the other uh, people in charge can stop me. Um, uh, another big deal is gradients. Um, I bet a lot of people have calculated gradients in the past. Uh, the most common place to calculate a gradient is at the toe of your structure. Um, if you're worried about uplift, uh, blowout, heave, all that stuff. Um, so gradient is your head loss um, over your length at which the head loss occurs. So, and remember, in this case, you don't have to do it over a total square if you don't want. You can do it over a partial square. You can, you can sketch in um, subdivisions in your squares if you need to. Excuse me. Um, so in this case, I didn't do that because I thought that would be too much uh, explanation for just a presentation. But um, uh, I did a uh, gradient at two locations. So uh, first off, we figure out what our delta H is, so the H across each square. And remember we talked about that earlier, your head drop across each square is the total head divided by the number of equipotential potential drops, so 4.45 feet. And then you want to measure the distance along the head, which head is going across. So that can change um, depending upon your size of your square. So in this case, I estimated it to be about 11 feet. So I got a gradient of 0.4. Um, this is a smaller square, so I estimated it to be about 5.5 feet, and you get a higher gradient of 0.81. So that's an, a useful um, knowledge to have when you're looking at areas of, that might be of concern areas where you have smaller squares um, compared to the rest of your model is areas probably where there's going to be one more flow and two higher gradients. So something to be um, cognizant of when you're looking at your uh, flow net. Okay. 
Uh, I wanted to show this example of uplift pressures on the base of a concrete structure. This comes from our EM 1901, and they walk through that in that EM as well. I think it's actually, this figure is actually shown twice in the current EM, um, and it will be shown again in uh, updates to the EM if that is ever published. Uh, so I wanted to, to walk through this example because uh, this is something you might find in the EM and, and want to have backup of how it's done. Um, so. I want to calculate the uh, uplift pressure, say, at point A, which is right there. You can see that there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to calculate a few things first. First, I'm going to calculate your delta H, which is your total head divided by the number of um, equipotential drops. And this is another fun one where instead of partial flow channels this time, we have partial potential equipotential drops. Partial equipotential drops. Ugh. So I'm going to count the number of equipotential drops. Um, we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This is a partial one, so 7.8, 8.8, 9.8, 10.8, 11.8, 12.8, 13.8, 14.8, 15.8, 16.8, 17.8, 18.8, 19.8, 20.8, 21.8, 22.8, 23.8, 24.8, 25.8, 26.8
Um, so here's an example of a modulus embankment on a, a more permeable foundation. So you can see down here the, the permeability of the foundation is equal to five times the permeability of the embankment. Um, and one of the interesting things about this, you can take a look at is you can see how they altered the flow lines as it entered the foundation because of the change in permeability from the embankment to the foundation. Um, so that's, that's one useful thing to see here. Another thing they've done here is they've increased the number of flow lines in this flow channel. They subdivided this flow channel um, so that they can get a little more resolution down at the toe in terms of flow at the toe. Uh, they've subdivided this one here um, into smaller squares to make sure that they're getting a reasonably accurate uh, curvilinear square layout here. Um, and you can also subdivide this area into a, um, uh, smaller, smaller squares so that you can calculate things like gradient at the toe. Um, if you're interested in gradient across two feet, four feet, whatever you're interested in for that model. <clears throat> and then it's got an uh, equation here for deflection of the flow and equipotential lines at that boundary between the embankment and the foundation. And it's uh, related to the uh, contrast between the permeabilities. So you can see one over five here for that difference in permeabilities. <clears throat> Excuse me. So here's that same model, um, the, where the foundation is five times more permeable than the embankment. But in this case, um, you have anisotropic soils. So they've reduced the horizontal dimensions by that equation, square root of kV times kH, to get um, a permeability here. And they've also, <clears throat> something you can do if you need to in a, in a permeability, in a flow net, is come up with an equivalent permeability. So if you're trying to look at average flow and you're not looking at flow in one direction or the other, you need an equivalent permeability, and that equivalent permeability is also equal to the square root of kV times kH. Um, so, other useful things to do with flow nets is analyzing um, different methods for uh, seepage cutoff, seepage reduction, seepage collection, stuff like that. I mentioned that. So, one of the main ways to reduce seepage through a foundation and then therefore reduce pore pressures and gradients at the downstream toe is to install a cutoff. Uh, a lot of times that comes in the form of a core trench, particularly an Army Corps dam. Um, and those will extend through the pervious soil to a less permeable, either like a clay layer or a rock layer or whatever is out at that site. Um, so one of the design uh, evaluations you need to do is determine the most efficient cutoff, efficient depth for your cutoff, because the deeper you go, the more expensive it is. In some cases, it is not, it becomes unfeasible to do a core trench, and you might have to look at a, like a cutoff wall, stuff like that. So there's some design uh, cutoff, uh, sensitivity studies you'll need to perform. So um, the, the biggest question usually comes is, do you need to cut off the entire pervious layer? Um, so as uh, shown in this figure, this comes from Cedargren, um, his 1989 textbook. Uh, they found that when doing seepage, they did a bunch of flow nets and seepage analyses. Um, a reduction in seepage is not linear cor linearly correlated with the penetration percentage of the cutoff in the pervious layer. So if you, for example, even if you cut off the pervious layer by 80%, you, your, your, your core trench goes 80% of the way into this pervious soil, you only get about a 50% reduction in seepage. Now, that might be enough for you. That might reduce your gradient at the toe enough. But um, in a lot of cases, it's not. Uh, so to get to like 80 to 100 percent reduction in seepage, um, you're looking at near 100 percent cutoff through the pervious soil. So that's why a lot of times um, when you're looking at design details and as-built drawings, your cutoff trench will go all the way through the soil that the uh, design team thought was the most pervious and needed to be cut off. So they'll go all the way through those. <clears throat> Here's another um, important uh, concept uh, for seepage through the embankment instead of seepage under the embankment. Um, so, as I mentioned, anisotropy is common even in our embankments because we construct our embankments in horizontal layers. 
Um, and on a previous slide, we looked at the anisotropy, even for well-constructed um, modern embankments, the anisotropy ranges from four to nine, um, the KH is four to nine times the vertical hydraulic conductivity. So um, in this example here, I've got a tow drain. You can see the little tiny tow drain here, and it's getting bigger and bigger here, and it becomes a full blanket drain as you get further down. Um, and they've sketched in flow nets for, this is an isotropic soil up here. And then here, your KH, your horizontal permeability is four times your vertical permeability. And then down here, your horizontal permeability is nine times your vertical permeability. And you can see with the same um, head, um, your, your permeability, your, your seepage can, continues to creep across your embankment um, as your uh, permeability, as your anisotropy increases. So um, it, it's, it, this, it, this kind of shows why um, it's become standard practice to include a chimney filter and drain in an embankment. Um, if you're worried about uh, seepage through your embankment, a uh, blanket drain is not going to do anything to reduce the seepage through the embankment and the pore pressures and the downstream slope because um, you're going to be dealing with some sort of anisotropy. You can't get rid of the anisotropy in your embankment. Um, with the construction, even with, with modern high-end construction methods, well-constructed embankments. Um, so if you have that kind of uh, pore pressure buildup and seepage in your embankment, you may have, you'll have seepage on the slope of your embankment potentially, um, and you could have issues with slope instability. So uh, this is the same example here, similar example with uh, a chimney filter put in here. So you can see as the uh, anisotropy increases, in this case, you're looking at uh, nine times the vertical, 16 times the vertical permeability, and 25 times the vertical permeability, so even higher um, anisotropies. Um, you put that filter in, and it cuts off all that seepage, and it allows that drain through and prevents any amount of seepage going into your slope, into your downstream slope. Um, and that filter design, uh, Greg's going to cover that in a bit more detail. I think in a later presentation today. So there's a lot of good information on how to design filters these days. <clears throat> right. Uh, other things to take a look at uh, um, with a seepage analysis, you can evaluate the location of a cutoff wall. So here's an example of a weir with different cutoff locations. As well as uh, at the bottom, you have um, uh, the addition of a tow drain. And so this illustrates the results of adding seepage mitigation and control measures in different areas of your embankment, or weir in this case, to make it a little easier. So if you look at the first two figures, um, at the top figure has the cutoff at the upstream tow, and then that middle figure has the cutoff located at the downstream tow of the weir. So if you can see kind of closely in at the toe of the uh, embankment there, or the toe of the weir there. And the top figure, the critical gradient approaches infinity, uh, and depending on the depth at which the gradient is measured. Um, and this gradient um, infinity is definitely going to be larger than the critical gradient of the soil, so you're going to initiate internal erosion. Um, and the second figure, the gradient was calculated to be 0.2, um, which in this case is generally, you're likely to be less than the critical gradient of your soil. Um, so you're, you're much less likely to initiate internal erosion. Um, however, however, the problem with that um, is then you get much higher uplift pressures on the base of your cutoff. So there's trade-offs in all cases that you need to evaluate. So we're just looking at gradients in this case, but there are a lot of other issues you might ha run into. So you need to evaluate uplift pressures. Um, in addition, and seepage quantities and all that stuff to make sure your design is adequate. Um, <clears throat> so, and then at the bottom here, you put in um, a cutoff at the upstream side, just like you did at the top, but then you put in a tow drain down at the toe of your weir. And that basically allows for uh, water to seep into the tow drain and prevents internal erosion um, from continuing um, because there's no unfiltered exit at that point. Uh, another thing you can take a look at with uh, flow nets is the position and size of your core. 
Um, so in this case, a lot of times uh, nowadays you see a central you see a central core embankment, um, but in older model in older embankments, um, I've seen a lot of upstream uh, trending cores. Um, you, see, you can see in this example an upstream core here, a core here where the, you don't have a downstream slope; it's a vertical slope. This one has a very thin upstream core. Um, so what you want to look at with these is kind of gradients at the downstream side of the core here. Um, so you can make sure you have a reasonable filter on the downstream side and you're not going to cause issues with gradients and, and stuff like that. Um, so you can see here the safest core um, gradients go from 0.8 to 1.6 to approaching infinity in these cases, much higher gradients for these sloped cores. Um, so this wide central core is the safest one. Um, unfortunately, we don't always get what we want, and a lot of times finding material for cores can be difficult, um, if not impossible in some cases. So a lot of times you'll have to deal with a smaller core, and you just have to make sure that your um, design accounts for that properly. So up until this point, I've been talking about cross-sections. 2D cross sections. Uh, another thing we can look at is plan view flow nets. So um, most of the time you look at, uh, when you start your design, you'll look at a, like a maximum cross section. A lot of times that'll be at the center of your embankment. That gives you some useful information, um, but you also need to analyze what's going on at your abutment. And um, one of the best ways to do this is with a plan view cross section. So, or a planned view flow net. So it's still 2D, but you're looking at it from above. Um, so in this case, you have your reservoir here on the upstream side. You have the center line of your dam here, and they've sketched the flow net around the uh, abutment of the, of the dam here. So what they're concerned here about is a permeable zone in the abutment and in the embankment. Um, so they've sketched their flow net in, and doing all the calculations, they are able to estimate the amount of seepage that's coming out, and they can account for that seepage, and they can collect that seepage properly so it doesn't cause any issues. All right, so raise your hand if you've ever used a flow net for design. If you've ever designed with a flow net. Yeah, probably not. Anybody done seepage analyses with CW or similar? Yeah, pretty much everybody. So we don't really use flow nets anymore. Um, I've sketched flow nets up just to check analyses or do a quick back of the envelope calculation before having all the information I needed to set up a seepage model. Um, but I've never actually used it for final design. Uh, so numerical analyses um, used for all the same applications of flow nets. Generally speaking, you can get use more complicated geometries in flow nets because you're not spending days trying to sketch in your flow net. I would add a caution, though, with numerical models is you can get as complicated as you want because it's easy to add in stuff, but a lot of times it's not helpful to add more complicated information. Um, and a lot of times that can throw your model off and throw your analysis off. So really you should be starting as simple as possible to begin with with a, with a seepage model and getting more complex as time goes on. Um, one of my biggest complaints about seepage models is um, it's not as easy to visualize flow patterns and results in a seepage in a numerical model um, as you can with flow nets. Uh, so when you're analyzing the results of your, of your of your seepage model, make sure you look at all the different output formats you can use to understand the model. So like in CW, you can look at gradients. Um, you can look at total head, you can look at pressure head, um, you can look at all kinds of stuff. So make sure you're looking through all that information that you have available. Um, a, a big deal, a bigger deal with numerical modeling, um, depending upon your, what you're going to be using the model for is you may need to properly characterize the hydraulic conductivity in the partially saturated to unsaturated zone of your soil, so above the phreatic surface. Um, that may not be an issue if you're just looking at under seepage, say under a levee or under your embankment, but it might become a bigger deal if you're worried about poor pressures in the embankment. Um, it's very, very important to calibrate the model and to perform sensitivity analyses. Now that you don't have to draw 
a new flow net every time you change your model parameters, you should be performing multiple sensitivity analyses with different hydraulic conductivities. Um, if your model geometry is changing, if there's some uncertainty in your subsurface conditions, which there usually is, you want to make sure you account for that in your sensitivity analyses. Um, if you have an existing embankment out there and you have instrumentation, you should be calibrating to the available data from that instrumentation. Um, I, it's a lot harder for Army Corps dams because uh, a lot of times we don't have great performance data because we haven't loaded a lot of our dams very high. But with, use what information you have available to you. Um, another important thing is to select the appropriate cross sections. Uh, you can do multiple models. So make sure you're not just looking at the maximum section. Um, there might be other areas of concern. Uh, the steady state analysis and the numerical analysis is a pretty equivalent solution to a flow net. So you know where you're coming from with that. Um, I do not recommend it, but you can perform transient analyses. Um, they're much more complicated and they require a lot of additional data and calibration that's not usually available to you in a um, standard and for a lot of our projects, a lot of the data that we don't have. Um, we've done them before on uh, risk assessments. I've seen them used more frequently on risk assessments, um, but we take them with a heavy grain of salt when we do use them. Uh, so here's one output that you can have. Um, this is the most common one I see. This is uh, lines of uh, equal head. Um, so this is basically the equivalent of equipotential lines that have been um, plotted on the results from your seepage analysis. Um, that's the first thing I usually look at when I look at a result of my seepage analysis. Another good thing to take a look at is plotting flow vectors on your analysis. Uh, so flow vectors will show you not only the direction of flow, but relative magnitude of flow. So you can see here that the flow magnitude is increasing through these squares compared to, say, these squares out here, which makes sense because you have to take all the flow coming from here and stick it through this smaller section here. Um, and they used to have, back in the day, you know, like two years ago, uh, CW used to be able to draw flux lines so that you could measure uh, flow across certain areas, but uh, the uh, owner of CW, Geoslope, found that people were using that incorrectly and inaccurately. So they have done away with flux lines um, and they have made it so that you can sketch in um, points here and draw graphs and calculate flow that way. So it's a little more complicated to get to, but you can still calculate stuff that you would normally have calculated with, say, a flux line, but a little harder to get to. You can sketch up flow paths. Uh, through your model. So here, this is their approximate estimate of flow through the model, uh, of a, that a particle of water would go through the model. Uh, so using this information and then using those equipotential lines, you can see here, you can kind of sketch in a flow net to help you visualize if you think this, the results are reasonable for this. If you understand flow net, you can sketch in an approximation of a flow net and see if it's accurate and reasonable. And it can help you find issues in your model. So if there's a, if something were funky were going on here with your phone net, uh, your phone net sketch, you could say, hey, there's something going on there. We need to look at that a little more closely. Um, and these results aren't an actual flow net, as you might sketch up, um, and they're not an actual solution of Laplace's equation in that way, because uh, CW uses, um, it solves Laplace's equation in a different way using finite element methods, but it's, it's pretty reasonable. Uh, here's uh, that issue I talked about with um, understanding flow above the phreatic surface. So in CW, in a seepage, in a numerical seepage model, you can actually have flow above your phreatic surface. <coughs> and this occurs in models where you um, assign the material a uh, saturated, unsaturated material model. At least that's what they call it in CW. They may call it something different in uh, other analysis programs. But um, the material model um, assigns a hydraulic conductivity based on soil suction calculated above the phreatic surface. So soil suction is just the tension that you're feeling um, between, between grains here because there's less water and it's not fully saturated. So there's like basically some capillary action going on. Um, so and soil function, soil suction, is a function of the degree of saturation. 
So hydraulic conductivity will be changing in this um, zone up here. It'll be actually getting smaller as your soil suction increases. Um, but however, the soil doesn't become impermeable. You're not giving it a zero permeability. So there's going to be some amount of flow above your phreatic surface in this case. Uh, here's a couple of more examples of numerical models. Um, just to show the similarity between numerical model results and flow nets. Uh, in this case, the um, upper one, the downstream tow drain was not modeled. Um, and then on the bottom one, the downstream shell was modeled. Um, because they are assumed to be much more permeable than the adjacent embankment materials, and so they weren't they weren't of interest to the designer. And they do this a lot in flow nets too. Uh, they do this a lot with flow net calculations too. You just didn't model your flow net in the more permeable material because it wasn't of interest. So they did that here, and that saves you from having to come up with material properties for the material that no longer interests you. Here's um, an example of an army cordium. So this is uh, the goal with this analysis um, was to evaluate seepage through this highly permeable foundation layer here, shown in dark yellow. So they had done a number of, of test fills of this embankment and um, over the life of the embankment, and had found that um, water just poured out of the toe of the dam every time they filled it up. Um, so they were concerned that that maybe wasn't the best thing to have happening, and probably wasn't all that useful in uh, an actual dam. Um, so they uh, actually worked with Harry Cedergren. Uh, he's worked with the core for he worked with the core for most of his career, and they drew up flow nets. They did evaluations. Um, they put in all kinds of seepage control measures, um, and these were all pulled together into a risk assessment uh, to evaluate it further. So um, I took a look at this as well because we had so much data on this dam. They've done all kinds of characterizations of it. They when they did these fillings, they monitored pore pressures, they um, and measured them continuously throughout the filling and even after the filling. So we had a lot of good information on that. Um, so I took a look and uh, did a seepage model with that information, um, and I found it actually to be a lot harder than I thought. Uh, I had Harry Cedergren's data; he, you know, expert in in the industry, expert in drawing flow nets, um, and had some really awesome flow nets that he sketched into the model. On, on the on the cross sections of the model um, of the dam and with flow nets <clears throat> you can focus on areas of interest so he was incredibly interested in the foundation permeability and the contrast between the foundation permeability and the embankment permeability so he didn't even come up with permeability for the embankment he just said it's you know this much less than the foundation well you can't do that in CW CW wants you to have an actual permeability. So I had to come up with an actual permeability. Um, and it was kind of a beast to calculate and, and calibrate this model to the per, to the um, piezometer result that we found um, that we had available to us. So, so the first thing I did um, was uh, plot contours of total head on the cross section. So you can kind of see that, yeah, it looks reasonable. You know, head's decreasing as you go from head water to tail water. That's great. Um, the phreatic surface here that I had was I compared it to the piezometer readings collected at this reservoir elevation when they did this filling. Um, and you can see I got reasonably close here, but not as close here. So that took some effort to kind of model that. Uh, these piezometers were in the foundation. So I was looking at foundation pore pressures, not pore pressures in the embankment. I also sketched up um, flow paths. So, uh, this was a, a lot more, even more fun um, than trying to compare to Cedar Grin's uh, flow model, or Cedar Grin's uh, flow net, um, because they didn't match at all. There was there was zero correlation between the two. Um, however, the area of interest, which is this foundation here, was a lot similar, a lot more similar. So I was able to get reasonable results in there. And then the final thing I looked at was. Um, flow vectors. I wanted to make sure that they observed in the field, you know, when they did these test fills, they observed in the field that water didn't come out of the embankment, but it poured out of the foundation and into relief wells, into pore pressure, into, I think they had some dewatering wells, and it just poured into there. So um, I wanted to prove that the flow in my model was coming in the same location that it was observed in the field. 
And in this case, you can see this basically black blob is uh, flow vectors pouring through my model. Um, so that correlated well with what they saw in the field. So using this, um, I had a calibrated model and I could increase the um, phreatic surface. I could increase the reservoir elevation to something that had never been seen in the past, see what could happen potentially in, in the future if this, this dam ever saw higher, higher flows, stuff like that. Um, you can look at pore pressures in that. You could see if we needed to add into the to the drainage features down here at the bottom. Um, I, I didn't, in this case, I didn't model any of the relief well systems they had in place there, um, but we could have added that in, um, see how that behaved, if the relief well system was good enough, stuff like that. So that's kind of where we were, why I did this analysis. See what I could see. Hey, Amanda. Yep. Just out of curiosity, I didn't see any pedometers in kind of the intermediate part of the downstream shell. This one looks like it's the upstream edge of the chimney filter. And then one, I think, at the downstream cell. So Yeah, so they had um they had one here um, tipped in the – these were all tipped in the foundation. Um, none of them were in the embankment. So they had one here um, in the foundation. They had one here at the upstream edge of the chimney filter. I think there's one I didn't plot on this section that was tipped in the chimney filter. Um, and then they had – yeah, they had one down here at the toe. Uh, they had others on other sections, but they didn't have any in this area. Okay. So um... – Curious, since you were looking at the foundation, do you think that that phreatic surface there is, is accurate? And do you think that the, the drain is overwhelmed, such so that the phreatic surface is up into the random downstream zone? Or no. I'm neglecting that just because you were focusing on the foundation. Yeah, so what I was, what I was calibrating to, um, was I thought that they were measuring foundation pore pressures um, and not any pressures in the embankment. I don't think that they actually had water in the drainage system. I think these were kind of almost artesian pressures in the foundation system. Okay, Does that make that, sense? Yeah. And I think that correlated well with what they saw in the field. They didn't see any water coming out of their drains, if I remember correctly. It came down out downstream. I guess one one more question, follow up question: Is that a, a yes. dry dam or does it hold pool often? It does not hold pool. Um, in fact, they uh, uh, it is a dry dam normally, and they actually keep the uh, they they currently keep the um, gates open. They don't they don't ever close the gates, so they never really hold pool unless it the outflow inflows are higher than the outflows. Which is not uncommon, but um, they don't they, they don't try to hold pool ever. Okay, thanks. That makes more sense. So then you wouldn't expect to see that phreatic surface to, to be the whole water in the pool that often. That that provides context for the for the purpose of the model. Thanks. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, so. One other thing that the core developed back in the day before um, uh, CW models became common and before it became easy to do uh, seepage modeling, like at the drop of a hat now that we do w the way we do it now, is some simplified solutions that they developed. Um, so here's an example that the Waterways Experiment Station uh, developed, uh, I think back in the 60s or 70s, to evaluate uh, initial designs of cutoff walls. So in this case, you have percentage of depth penetrated, so little d over big D of the depth here, and then um, you're, you can look at different lengths of your embankment over your depths of your aquifer, and that can help you kind of evaluate seepage reduction. Um, this is just a quick start to kind of give you an idea. You wouldn't use this for final design, but I just wanted to point out that those are out there. That's all I had for this. 